More problems or something. We got. We got. He needs a break. <laughs> but you know, when you get behind the wheel of a car, you are taking a privilege that comes with great responsibility. I mean, just imagine the amount of kinetic energy that's being generated by a three thousand pound car moving at forty miles an hour. And I didn't heed the warning signs. I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't being safe. And I failed in my responsibility to navigate that vehicle properly, correctly, and within the parameters that are governed. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42, keep watch because you do not know in what day the Lord will come. That officer was probably in a shadow under a tree somewhere. I never saw him at all. But he was right there watching. And my ignorance was not an excuse. And I would have deserved anything he wanted to give to me that day. It was only by sheer grace that he let me go with a warning. The Bible gives us prophecy to say the Lord is coming. Keep watch. Because he'll return at a time when maybe you're not prepared. He could be coming in a moment when you don't understand or you don't, you've fallen asleep or you're not watching the warning signs or you've let down your guard. Christ be, could be coming at any moment and will you be ready? Will you be living your life responsibly for Him or will you be living your life for yourself? And He wants us to be warned because we don't know the day in which the Lord will return. The second story I'd like to give to you, I heard from a guy by the name of Chip Ingram. He's a guy I like to listen to once in a while. And he was um, retelling the story from a, year, year, a few years back when he was traveling home from a missionary trip to India. He was with a traveling buddy, and, and his friend had called home to check on the family. They were boarding the plane and then flying home, and uh, like on a layover or something, they had an opportunity to call home and say that everything was fine, and he'd be home soon, and he was just kind of checking in. And his son answered the phone. And when his son answered, he just immediately, his son went into uh, this panic because he was watching a basketball game, an Olympic basketball game. And he was an absolute basketball fanatic. He watched every game. He played bas basketball. He, used to, he would wear his favorite jersey while he was watching all the games on TV. He even slept with his basketball at night. He loved basketball. And now he's sitting here watching an Olympic game with one of those early dream teams. And uh, there, uh, you know, during like this is probably early uh, 90s. And in this particular game that he's watching, his dream team, his heroes, the best players from around the world all on one team. And yet they were losing the game badly at the half. <laughs> And now dad was calling home to check on the family and the son's watching the game and he's just in desperation. He says, dad, I can't believe it, but they're losing. He says, they're so far behind at half point, I can't believe it. I don't think they can come back. I don't think they can do it. They're not going to win. Dad, they're going to lose this game. What is the world coming to? <laughs> Little 10 year old boy just in a panic. Well, he was panning and dad, but dad says, okay, you know, son, calm, calm down. It's going to be all right, son. Don't, don't you worry. Trust me. I, you know what? I can give you a guarantee they will not lose this game. I want you to know that. I want you to count on that. You keep watching. You keep cheering. You don't give up. They will win this game. So he calms his son down. He goes, really, Dad? And he got all excited again. Okay, I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch. I'm going I'm to root him on. You know, he's thinking, I'm going to do my part, and my fan part, and my, you know, my, my cheering on is going to help them win this game. Well, they did. They came back to win. Well, it wasn't because Dad was speaking prophetically. Uh, nor was it just the wishful promises of another person basketball fan. Dad actually knew the American team would come back from behind in a miracle uh, in, in a miracle game and would win this basketball game. But the reason or the way he knew, how, knew that was because the game was on a 12-hour tape delay. Oh, 
and he'd already watched the final four minutes and knew exactly what was going to happen. But his son didn't know that because he was just seeing it for the first time. And so dad knew without a shadow of a doubt how the game was going to end. And the team was going to be victorious. You know, sometimes in the middle of the game, things can look a little bleak. Sometimes the team's behind. Sometimes stuff's not going the right way. Sometimes it's just not working out. And it seems like there's no way victory will come. There's no hope. There's no way we're going to win. And maybe in one way or another, you've cried out to your Heavenly Father saying, God, how much worse can it get? How much farther down can I go? How much, how much heavier uh, you know, can the oppression be? How much more difficult? Father, how can you wait another day? I mean, what is going on? And maybe in one way or another, you've cried out to the Heavenly Father saying, this is hopeless. What is the world coming to? Evil seems to be winning. The wrong side has the victory. There are people who are re have rejected God, but somehow they look like the blessed ones. They look like the ones living the high life. They look like the ones that are doing well. This isn't fair. It doesn't seem right. And our Heavenly Father is telling us, don't worry. I know how the game ends. I know how it's going to turn out. And can I tell you something? We win. I guarantee it. And our Heavenly Father looks down upon us and says, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you will going through, no matter how dark it ever seems, Jesus Christ is going to return. Mounted on a horse of victory to redeem His children. And He will be victorious. And the Bible wants us to know He guarantees it. So this series is really about faithfulness. And I believe that's the purpose of biblical prophecy, is to use warnings and promises to urge us to continue to trust in God. The Bible tells us about the imminent return of Jesus Christ, not for the purpose of creating the denominational lines that have emerged or the endless debate that seems to happen. And I'm not saying all that discussion is bad. It's not. It's, it's good and, and, and great things can come out of that when it points us back to Jesus Christ. But the meaning of these prophecies and the purpose of the things that, uh, that, that are said, why we need to know these things or why they're giving to us is because we need to heed the warnings to live our lives for Jesus Christ and then find hope as we're waiting for His return. It's like a speed limit sign on the side of the road that says, this is what you need to do. Be careful. Keep your life within the boundaries of God. Stay awake. Stay safe. Live your life responsibly for Him. And prophecy says to us, be warned. God is coming. He's sending His Son to take back His people. A judgment day will be upon us. We have to stand with our lives before a great and holy and just God to make an account of who we are and how we've lived. But for those that have been faithful and those that have lived for Him and those that have sought after the things of God, you can be assured and you can know that no matter what you've gone through and no matter how bad it's gotten, victory is coming to you. And it'll be okay. So will you trust in Him? Will you be faithful in this day to your Heavenly Father? So, with that, let's look at um, just an intro uh, text uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 1. And I mentioned we're going to actually be studying the seven churches of Asia that uh, begins in chapter 2. So we'll get to that next week. I just, in way of introduction this morning, want to you know, tell you where we're going and why we're, why we're going there. And uh, want to um, just give us more of a, an introduction today. And as you're turning there, It'd be good to notice that this book was written by the Apostle John. Um, in the opening verses, 
he points out in verse 1, he says, the very opening words, he says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now the word literally here means uncovering or an unveiling, kind of like stepping out from behind a curtain or being unwrapped. The point is, is uh, or as, as we look at this, the, the reason this is here, this is actually fairly significant because at this point in church history, at the writing of this text, a very heavy curtain had fallen over the church. All the other apostles at this point had been killed. And the author of this text, John, is the only one that's left. And he is now probably around a 90-year-old man, prisoner of Rome on, a re on the remote island of Patmos. The church is in real trouble. And Christians everywhere are being martyred for their faith. Some of them are being sent out of their homes. Some of them being tortured. Some of them even being put to death. At this point, they still did not have the canonical Bible like we have, to, we have to, to guide them in instruction. And there's a lot of confusion going on about truth. There's very little set standard for them at this point. Who to listen to, which letters to follow, what teacher to, 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 uh, you know, to listen to and what they're saying. And it's created a lot of infighting and a lot of division amongst the churches on who to believe and what to believe and who to listen to and who to follow. You see that at, at times throughout some of the New Testament uh, uh, books. You know, should I, should I listen to Paul? But I, I follow Apollos. And, and, and there was a lot of fighting and division in churches. And here John himself is suffering and he writes about it and he's hurting. And he's identifying with the idea and the knowledge that there's other brothers and sisters in the Lord that also are enduring great hardship too. He's in prison. He's had it rough. They've tried to shut him up. They've tried to stop him. And the only thing that they, that's been left to do short of killing him is just to throw him in jail and let him die as he rots away there. And he's right saying, and I know you have it bad too, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I know that it's difficult. And so on a Sunday morning, much like today, He's praying to the Lord. And God speaks to him. He actually speaks to him and gives him the vision. And John writes out the book of Revelation. And the basic message is, send a warning. Tell my children, don't give up. Don't shrink back. Don't quit. But have hope. Because my son Jesus is coming to rescue the redeemed. So in Revelation chapter 1, when we begin with verse 4, I want to read uh, verses 4 through 8. It says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before the, his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. How would you like to be those guys? The ones that put him on the cross, and here he comes in victory. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, as we just kind of unpack a little bit of these verses, um, we look at the author from whom these words come. Who is speaking to us? Who gives us the words? Who wants us to understand the message that's being conveyed here, the vision, if you will, that John is recording? As he's writing it down, he, he himself is not the author, and he wants to understand these are not my words. This is not what I'm saying to you. This is not my ideas or my impressions. These, these are not coming from me. There's a different author that's giving this to you. 
And John brings and writes down this greeting that comes from God the Father who is described in the title in, the, in verse 4. Him who is and who was and is to come. This phrase, these words speak of the eternal nature of God. The God that has always been. God that is timeless. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And he's stating here that um, a, a phrase that's connected with that name of Yahweh that's found in the Old Testament back in Exodus chapter 2. It was a name that was so holy, uh, we don't actually know the word. We don't actually know how to pronounce it because the Jews believe that to speak the name of God was blasphemous. And so they, they uh, just used kind of an abbreviation, a Hebrew abbreviation, if you will, to, to refer to God. But encompassed in his name is this idea that he always is. He always is. He always was. He is him who is to come. There is no beginning to him. There is no end. We are talking God over all things, the eternal one. And he goes on and talks about the seven spirits. Now this is interesting um, in exactly what he's saying here. He might be referring to seven different spirits, a messenger for each church, because there's seven churches. It could be that he is referring to the idea of um, uh, the completeness of the Spirit of God, seven being a number of completeness. But I did in particular like one commentator's thought that, that thought perhaps the seven spirits could be a reference to Isaiah 11.2 which describes seven aspects of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit given in seven different characteristics. That verse says, Isaiah 11.2 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might or strength, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. Seven different characteristics or understanding brings of the to us and gives to us as He fills our life. And so I, I like that idea, that, or at least this, this could be the idea that He's saying what He's referring to here is the Holy Spirit and how He impacts our lives. And then lastly, He goes on and says, and from Jesus, who is the faithful witness. Jesus is faithful and he's trustworthy. But also he goes on to say he's the firstborn of the dead. He immediately alludes to the salvation that's available in Jesus Christ, which uh, belongs or is given to those who believe in him. Those that will receive him in their own spiritual resurrection upon the return of Christ. Jesus, he goes on to say, freed us from sin. And so he's saying, here's the author. You need to understand who this is coming from. You need to get the importance of this message being given to you. It is from God the Father. It is given to you from God the Holy Spirit. And it is given to you from God the Son. The completeness of the Trinity, the wholeness in every aspect of who they are, their majesty, the, the magnificence of, the intersection of God into human history, and all that that is encompasses, a message is now coming to you. It's almost to say, this is a pretty important thing you should take note of. I don't think you could say it any more profoundly. There's no more words you could have added to, to, to give weight to the importance of this message. And that message begins by saying, look, He is coming in the clouds. Jesus is coming. And every eye will see Him. Even those who pierced Him. Those that have wronged Him. Those that have turned from Him. Those that put Him on the cross, which is... Uh, which. What, what put him there? It's the sins of each and every one of us. And he says, And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. I don't think we know. I don't think we understand. I don't think from this side of history we recognize what it means to stand before Jesus on the day that he comes. Every sin every wrong, 
every fault laid bare. Everything that we've ever done may be reflected in the glimmer of His eye. Everything that we didn't do, every moment that we wasted, every person we didn't share Him with, every opportunity that we could have lived for Him, but we didn't. And we wasted away an opportunity. All in that moment, we're standing before Jesus Christ and we finally, for the first time, realize the importance and the, the level of sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave for us. I think it'll be a day of mourning. He goes on later in the book to say that in heaven every tear will be wiped away. Now does that mean that the tears of earth will be wiped away? Or is it possible that that means that when we cross over into heaven and we're standing before God and we for the first time realize everything that it meant and for the first time we realize everybody that's not going to be there with us. And for the first time we realize the, the depravity of our sin compared to a great and holy God. Is it possible that in that moment there is no other response but to mourn over all that we've lost? I mean, how can a tear not come to our eye now? I mean, who do you know right now is not walking with Jesus Christ? And if He came back today, they would be lost forever. Their soul damned to the lake of fire, destroyed because they did not receive the grace and love of Jesus Christ. People you love and care about are going to be gone because we simply did not tell them the truth. Or how can we not grieve over the sin and, and the, 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 the faults and the failures in our own flesh? The times that we didn't trust Him and the times we were careless with Him and the times and the ways we rejected Him in our own lives. I think mourning, a great day of mourning, is coming. And so I simply, with the, those thoughts and those beginning stories, just ask you to, to think about which one do you need to hear today? Which story speaks to you today? Which, which aspects of, uh, of these prophetic words would say to you, Jesus is coming, so watch. Keep watch and be ready. Do you need to hear the warning today? Do you need that message that says, keep your eyes out, don't get caught asleep, don't be lazy in your faith, don't give up, don't head down the wrong path. Be warned because Jesus is coming and you need your life to be right with Him. John writes in verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering in the kingdom and the patient, and patient endurance that is yours in Jesus Christ. He's saying the road can be tough. The road can seem long. And it's so easy to be distracted. It's so easy to be captivated by other things. It's so easy to be taken the wrong way. Will instead Jesus return and find you serving Him, living for Him, faithful unto Him. Or will he find you arguing with your brother or sister? Will he find you angry at a world that needs to know about him? Will he find you in sin and trapped in the very things that his blood was meant to set you free? What warning do you need from him? What, what, what word of, of truth should come to you today? 
that we might be ready and we would not fall away. Because many are walking out of the church. Many are walking out of the faith. Many are giving up on their belief in Jesus Christ. Many have given up and they're tired of waiting and they say, I don't think he's coming. But you don't be deceived because this day you've been warned. So heed that warning and turn your heart to him in faithfulness. Or maybe today you need that message of hope. Maybe that's the word that comes to you that says he is coming. So don't give up and don't lose heart. That may, though it may seem dark today, though it may seem difficult right now, though may every, perhaps everything feels like you're struggling and, and, and you don't know if you're going anywhere and you don't know if things are going to get better and you don't know what you're going to do. But trusting in the Lord, hoping in the Lord, He's saying to you, just remember, I know how this game ends. I know the final score. I know what's going to happen. We win. I guarantee it.